Okay, it's time to get started. So my name is Frederick and in this webinar I will focus entirely on substance regulations, when essentially regulations that, that concern chemicals, heavy metals and other harmful substances in, in consumer products. And regardless of your industry, regardless of what kind of products you're selling, or importing or manufacturing, substance regulations have an impact. Substance regulations apply essentially to all consumer goods to some extent regardless of material and age group. So yeah, we've got quite a bit of ground to cover and this is not just about, well this in this webinar I will not just uh, repeat a lot of information about the specific regulatory requirement but also take an approach where I really explain the fundamentals to help you understand how to deal with substance regulations and, and let's say chemical compliance as a whole from a supply chain perspective, from a practical perspective. But first we look at um, the basics, what substance restrictions are, different types. Then we move on to uh, looking into a few practical cases of substance regulations in the EU and the UK and also the US. We look into how you can identify the relevant uh, substances for a certain product or material. Then we look into compliance risks uh, for toys, electronics, and also jewelry to help you understand why some some materials and why some products contain certain substances and what sort of let's say supply chain risks that you can expect. And then we'll finally go into, well, the part that I find really interesting, which is compliance in practice. How do you deal with supply test reports, uh, lab testing, test report validity, and so on. Okay, let's get to it. And so just a few words about compliancegate.com. So we help imports, brands, and manufacturers understand compliance requirements and, and also apply it in practice. We we have a platform where you can essentially log in, you identify uh, product requirements in, in minutes, and then you can start creating certificates, label files, book lab testing, and so on. Um, and that's what we call the Compliance Gate platform. Our background is in manufacturing and product development, and we're based in Hong Kong. Most of our customers are based in Europe and the US, though. A few words about me, that's me on the right. So my name is Frederick, co-founder of ComplianceGate.com, also based in Hong Kong and my background is in, in product development manufacturing. I spent a lot of time uh, over the last 10 years working on uh, factory floors in, in Asia, primarily in mainland China and also Vietnam. I also have quite a bit of experience with manufacturing in, in Europe and, and Turkey. Okay. So if you have attended any of our webinars in the past, which I suspect many of you have, if not most, then you know that you can also ask questions. So the um, the questions box, if I can call it that, will be open throughout the entire presentation. And I personally respond to almost all questions, as long as it's relevant to today's topic. So just send as many questions as, as you want, and I'll get back to you by tomorrow. Okay. Let's get to it then. Let's get to today's topic. So start with introduction. Warm you up a bit. Now, what are substance restrictions? There are different types. It could be a substance restriction can be a limitation. It could be that lead is restricted to a thousand ppm based on a weight. That means the material in question, whatever it may be, can contain lead in this concentration, but if it's above, then it is no longer compliant and I cannot sell that product. Some substances are completely banned. There's no limit. It's just, it's just banned. It cannot contain the substance. Three, we have migration limits. This is something that's uh, a term that's, that's often referred to when it comes to food contact material. Um, substance restrictions and migration can refer to migration that occurs depending on certain conditions when a material is heated, frozen, comes in contact with certain liquids. And generally speaking, when we when we talk about migration limits, we're referring to the requirements where 
substances should not be transferred from say say uh, a plastic material to the food in in say a food container or something like that just to give you some context for we have registration and reporting requirements there are substances such as SBHCs on reach in the EU that are not banned but in case it turns out that your product contains such a substance you need to register the substance in in say the uh, SEIP database so there are different types of substance restrictions sometimes they're limited other times they're banned sometimes the limits concern migration that substances should not be transferred from say from say a plastic um, to 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 a food or beverage when it's in a, say, a microwave oven for example sometimes it refers to registration and finally i also want to make it clear that the specific substance requirement even for the very same substance can differ depending on the product and material the age group and other parameters okay that's the basics so a couple of examples of restricted substances uh, lead cadmium pfas and also the various phthalates. These are banned for all sorts of reasons, but could refer to everything from um, harmful impact on, on human fertility, on uh, fetus development, on um, hormonal disruption, children, for example. All sorts of, of, of different reasons for, for restricting uh, chemicals. And there's oftentimes also overlap, I want to make that clear, between regulations, even, even say within the EU. Okay, so that was the introduction. Let's go forward to some actual regulations, and you might be familiar with many of these. So, first we have REACH. It's, uh, many consider it to be the most comprehensive uh, chemical regulation in the world and essentially it, it, it sets uh, restrictions and, and, and limitations and reporting requirements and and so on and so forth for very long list of substances in the EU be it as a mixture or be it in the form of articles or products reach applies to all consumer goods in the EU that's also something that's that's unique quite unique for the EU that this 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 comprehensive uh, regulation that covers all consumer goods in the EU, regardless of, of age group and, and, and product type and so on. Second, we have ROHS, and ROHS directive, it sets limits on um, heavy metals and certain phthalates in electronics. Also requires a C mark. That's a very core, it's, it's a substance regulation. We also have various food contact material regulations in the EU. The uh, 1935-2004 framework regulation applies to all food contact materials in the EU and FCM in this case could refer to everything from say a plastic lunchbox, a fork, um, an espresso machine or uh, a pizza box, food contact materials. Uh, as said there's also FCM regulations that are specific to certain materials. That's uh, plastics uh, covered by regulation 10-2011. Uh, BPA restrictions that apply to plastic infant feeding bottles and these are just a few examples just to give you an idea this is the EU battery directive uh, again uh, it's uh, specific to batteries in this case and it sets limitations on on uh, a number of uh, heavy metals finally we have something that's quite interesting it's not a regulation it's, it's actually a standard it's EN 71-3 uh, 2019 I'm not sure if that's the latest one, but that's the one I could find anyway. Safety of toys, migration of certain elements, and I think it also uh, primarily covers a set of um, heavy metals and also phthalates. So, as said, there's overlap, but there can be differences in the test methods, there can be differences in terms of the exact limits, or if a substance is banned, for example. Um, and the reason I also listed the standard is, is, to, is to make it clear that substances are not restricted exclusively under regulations but also under standards in some cases and again there can be overlap okay now as you can see here we reach applies to all consumer goods as i mentioned but overlap doesn't necessarily mean that one excludes the other in many cases there's more than one substance restriction, substance regulation 
that apply to the exact same product. So we take stuff like plastic toys. We have to take reach into consideration and E in 71-3. Now, I don't know to which extent these two overlap, but they do technically both apply to the plastic toy. Now, let's say it's an electronic toy. Well, then I also have to take ROHS into consideration. Again, overlap, but they do apply, and I'm sure they exist for a reason. Could be a difference in terms of test methods, in the scope, uh, in in terms of in terms of the uh, the limitations and so on. You take an electric blender. Well, I don't have to take a toy safety standard into consideration, but I need to take food contact materials material regulations into consideration, which goes beyond say reach, as it also covers certain migration limits. Yeah, under, under the conditions for which the blender is supposed to be used, but you would definitely need to take certain, certain, uh, say, uh, heat conditions and so on into consideration. A coffee cup, well, it's not electric, so I don't have to take ROHS into consideration anymore. Okay, anyway, this is just to demonstrate the the way that this, this can be applied in, in, in practice. And this is not by any means unique to the European Union. Uh, this is um, the same the same logic applies, uh, say, in the US or anywhere for that matter. But this is just to demonstrate that you, you might, you're quite likely to be dealing with more than one regulation that one way or the other concerns chemicals and heavy metals for the same product. Okay, and we look into the US CPSIA, uh, Consumer Product Safety Initiative um, Act, I think. It covers uh, children's products in the US, 12 year olds or younger. And it says uh, requirements concerning, uh, well, limitations for lead and I think also phthalates. Then there's also a set of uh, food contact material regulations under 21 CFR. Again, these are just a few examples, but also uh, relates to migration limits. California Proposition 65, that's in, 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 in California. And uh, I think they restrict more than 800 substances, also in consumer goods, well, consumer products as a whole, uh, doesn't concern the age group, unlike CPSAA. Many of our customers, they, they, uh, they get their products tested according to uh, California Proposition 65 um, in order to, yeah, to broadly verify, verify uh, compliance as it covers so many different substances. Doesn't mean that you always test, well, you, you never test uh, a single material from 800 substances, which I will get to in a bit. Uh, another thing that's also important when it comes to the US is that many of the substance re regulations are not on a federal level, but on a state level. That's often overlooked and makes the, let's say, makes it significantly more difficult to deal with as, as say there are different PFAS bans for say cookware and so on it can be in New York in, in Washington and as you can see here in California Prop 65 uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a California regulation right so um, yeah it's, it's 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 more tricky to to deal with substance compliance uh, in the US as you as you have to take um, various state level regulations into consideration that often concern a single substance or a s certain set of substances, as I said, like PFAS or maybe phthalates, and these may then target a specific uh, product type, like uh, cookware or uh, infant uh, feeding bottles or toys as a category. Right. Okay. These are a few examples of uh, substance re regulations in the EU and the US. Oh, I forgot. So, when it comes to the UK, so in post-Brexit reality, um, many UK regulations still refer, or are to a large extent, based on EU regulations. Sometimes referring directly to EU regulations. So, in the UK, for example, is UK reach, and we did a comparison in 2022, and and. We haven't done any sense, but at least back then uh, we couldn't really find any difference in terms of substance, in terms of differences. ROHS is also exists in, in the UK, various FCM regulations. At least at that point, they also reference, directly reference EU regulations. 
battery director I'm not sure about. I th yeah, EN71-3. Um, might be a British version now. But the point is that the, the requirements are very similar. Also in the UK. We'll see how we'll see how this develops in the future though. Okay, let's go back then. Alright, so now we're done with that. So a big question is how do you know which substances to test for? And this can really be it's a two step procedure. First you need to identify which regulation apply to a product or material. That's step one. Is it REACH and ROHS and maybe EN71-3? As, as, as I demonstrated, that depends on the product parameters, essentially. And then, second, once you've done that, you need to look at the list of restricted substances under each regulation and determine which are relevant to the specific product, material, and age group. Even within the regulations, there are differences um, depending on the material, the age group, and the usage. That being said, unless you have a compliance team or compliance expert in in your company, which I guess that many of you don't, then the best option is not to try to do this at home, but go to a testing company, a qualified testing company like Intertech, SGS, Kima, TV, Rhineland, etc. Give them a well share you need to share a bill of materials, they need to see the exact list of materials that go into your product. They need to know the age group, they need to know the usage. And based on that, they can then determine which substances are relevant in terms of a testing protocol for your product. You don't have to do that yourself. That's that's really part of the quotation procedure. Because when you go to a testing company and ask them for, for a test quotation, they have to do this assessment or they can't even give you a price. You shouldn't abuse this though. It's not like they provide this as a free service. It's not like you can give them like bill materials for a hundred products and expect them to do all that work. But it's something that you can do when you reach out to a testing company. You can do it in an early stage so that you can you can start mapping out the different substance substance uh, restrictions and the specific substances to test for and communicate to your supplier and so on. Well, well before you place an order. Okay, let's look into a few real life cases of um, risks in the supply chain. Start by toys. So paints containing lead. That's, that's a classic. Or um, one of the major risks is 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 plastics containing phthalates. So, phthalates it's it's a group of uh, plasticizers used in soft plastics. Increases durability, overall quality. Uh, that's also something to consider here. That many of these these um, plastics they, well, sorry, these chemicals and substances have they are uh, have been used uh, because they have improved the durability, the quality. Uh, usability of, of these materials but as as um, well uh, studies in, in more recent years and decades have revealed that phthalates uh, have uh, well it disrupts hormones it has a negative impact on on fertility on uh, yeah on on um, on reproduction which is of course extremely negative. So uh, while the EU, I would say, took the lead on on restricting that, but in any case, what I'm getting to is that plastics are uh, sometimes contain phthalates. So that's definitely a risk when it comes to to toys or any plastic product for that matter. Second, we have electronics. Um, Typical risk would be components containing lead, cadmium, and other restricted heavy metals. Solder can also contain these heavy metals, and plastic parts can contain phthalates, all of which are restricted under ROHS, for example. Now, ROHS, the, the ROHS directive, it's another EU directive, but it's also been adopted in, in many US states. And just because you're not selling in the EU, you still have to take it into consideration. In fact, there are a wide range, well, array of countries that have uh, adopted, uh, well, have some sort of reach regulation, uh, sorry, ROHS regulation in, in China, in, uh, in India, in uh, Korea, and as I said, many US states. 
jewelry. Um, one example is plating, that's like gold plating and so on, that can contain excessive amounts of restricted heavy metals. So even if the base material doesn't, well, you still need to verify compliance because the applied plating might. Um, jewelry parts might contain nickel, that's also under reach, I think it's also restricted under California Prop 65. Uh, an interesting one is uh, zinc alloy parts containing high concentrations of cadmium. Well, a few years ago, we we were dealing with a um, batch of jewelry that failed testing. And I'm getting ahead of myself here, but it is related to, to point, point three here. But anyway, maybe we should start at point one. So on this slide, I want to answer the question some of you may have why do we why do some materials contain restricted substances why don't we live in a perfect world where all materials are just manufactured to be compliant just call it a day and just be done with it why why does it have to be so complicated why why do we even need these regulations what what if we just all agree to manufacture products that don't make us infertile that don't cause cancer that don't cause birth defects and all these nasty things. Why can't we just get, just get rid of all this? Well, it's 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 a bit more complicated than that. There are three main reasons that I will discuss in this presentation. And first is because it's cheaper to produce such materials. You can take okay. I clearly didn't finish this part, but what I intended to write was the the treatment process for, for leather. They un undergo a uh, um, what do they call it? Um, Anyway, it's 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 a procedure where where leather is uh, yeah it's called tanning now I remember uh, leather tanning procedure uh, can transfer if I can use that term certain heavy metals to the leather and using such substances in the tanning process is a lot cheaper than using uh, natural natural. Uh, substances called vegetable tanning for example which is a lot more expensive it, less harmful chemicals but it simply costs a lot more and it's the same thing if you look at say if you look at say producing a plastic without phthalates or at least phthalates below the limits or at least that we can't be detected it's more expensive compared to if you use phthalates in the same plastic i started dealing with with phthalates when I lived in Shanghai and you know back then the suppliers they were asking you we 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 went to these factories in in Hangzhou and also outskirts of Shanghai and we were rep represented uh, customers in Europe at that time and the suppliers just asked us do you want us to produce this 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 product with phthalates or without phthalates and they're two different price uh, price tags okay so there's a reason there's a reason that these materials exist on the market and they can contaminate your supply chain. Another reason is that not all materials and components that are produced on this planet are produced for consumption in the United States, the EU, the UK or other developed markets. There's a huge market in, in, uh, in less developed countries where you simply don't have phthalate restrictions, where they don't ban lead, where they don't ban cadmium and so on, and if they do, maybe it's not that enforced. What this means is that there's a market for plastics that contain high concentrations of phthalates. There's a market for jewelry that contain nickel uh, above the limits of the European requirements, for example. So that's why these materials exist, and that's why it's difficult to deal with this stuff. Three, well, sorry, second, this the risk of contamination. Um, that's another story from when I when I lived in Shanghai, but back then, um, as I said, we worked with these these toy uh, toy producers. Well, they were producing PVC materials for the toy industry, to be specific, and one time. A supplier that we had worked with for for years, um, the product came off the production line, 
and it was subject to a routine reach test. This was in, I don't know, in 2013 or something, so it's, it's quite a while ago. Any case, it turned out that the, uh, the PVC contained um, a fallet above the set limit. And we were very confused. And it was it was just barely above, so it wasn't. It was clear that the supply didn't try to screw us over. That usually, if they would have produced according to say the default cheap PVC with a lot of phallus, you know, it would have been across the board. You know, it would have not have been just one phallus. I think it was DHP, the usual suspect, which was barely above the the EU limit. Well. They investigated, and it turned out it turned out that the material was contaminated by a uh, machine lubricant. So what we see here with reason too is that sometimes compliance, uh, well, n compliance issues with, in 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 terms of substances can happen even with the best of intentions. Because it can be a result of a machine uh, malfunctioning issue with a mixture. And this can happen, you know, way up the uh, way up streams. It can be that is one supplier of a certain mixture screw up, and then an entire batch of plastics made somewhere uh, shipped out to a hundred factories, and there you go, there you go. So even in a uh, theoretical scenario, in in a perfect world where everyone is producing uh, materials according to the very highest the, the highest requirements in the world it would still be a risk. Although reason to is say well it's 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 I would say it's it's a fraction. It's a fraction uh, it's driving a fraction of the say compliance issues compared to reason one. That's that's the big one. That's really the big one. Reason three is also interesting. That's when materials naturally contain restricted substances. It's quite rare I've only dealt with this in one uh, in one single case, and that was for jewelry. Well, it turned out that the customer they had selected a zinc alloy for a jewelry piece, and as it turned out, jewelry had um, fairly strict uh, limits in t for, for cadmium under the reach regulation in the EU, and when they subject well they sent in samples for testing and it turned out that these zinc alloy jewelry parts um, they contain cadmium and it was off the charts well we did some research and found that zinc ore naturally tends to contain high levels of cadmium so it can be tricky but it can be wise to do some research that before you pick a material does it naturally contain a restricted substance? Because if it does, then perhaps you should pick another material, stainless steel or something. But I would say that 99.9% .9 of all cases, when it comes to compliance issues related to, to consumer goods containing high amounts of chemicals and heavy metals, is reason one, is reason one. Okay, now let's look into solutions. We've been discussing problems a lot, but now let's look into what we can do to mitigate these risks. Right, so one way that you can verify compliance, and verify compliance in this case means to determine if a product contains um, restricted or restricted substances above the set limits. But one way this can be done the ideal way, I would say, is to obtain supply test reports. This could, for example, be that if you're making, let's say you're manufacturing, okay, plastic toys. And if you know the plastic granule, the raw material, the plastic pellets, comes from, say, an established brand like Formosa Plastics, then, then you can, most likely anyway, obtain test reports from this brand, from this raw material supplier. So you go back to the source and you verify compliance that way. Likewise, let's say you're manufacturing watches. You don't need to get the movement tested if it comes from Casio. Why? Because Casio is a Japanese world-leading manufacturer of, of, of uh, watch parts, of, of uh, movements. 
And this means that when they make a movement, it's complying with RHS in the EU. Okay? Now, why, why do you want to use supply test reports? Because it's expensive with lab testing. It's really expensive if you have a, a wide range of products and, and, and various different materials for each. Especially as substance regulations are not static. There's a lot of movement in this field. There's, there's new substances being restricted. They are adding new substances. They are changing limits. They are, things are becoming more strict. And it's not going away. There's been a lot of noise about PFAS. Reach is being updated, I think, twice a year. Now, if you're going to stay up to date, it's, it's going to be expensive. As you can see here, point two. Now, using supply test reports requires that you have a strong grip on your supply chain. This means that you must carefully pick out this, the material suppliers if you go to an average, the average supplier in, say, China or Vietnam or Turkey, they can't provide a single test report. Nothing. This strategy only works if you handpick the raw material suppliers. This means that you can't just go to a supplier, send them a, a product specification and say, hey, give me a quote, and, and, and then you let them pick the material suppliers. That will never work. Even if they can guarantee compliance, they will source local suppliers, the cheapest local suppliers, and these generally, even if they can technically adjust the formula to say make plastics that don't contain phthalates and so on, or apply, say, plating to a, to a metal surface that don't contain excessive amounts of lead and cadmium, even then they can provide pre-existing test reports. The only companies that can are big brands like Formosa Plastics or Casio, something like that. There also applies when it comes to electronics. You need to pick su brand name suppliers. Now, for batteries, you pick Sony, or you pick Panasonic, or you pick TDK. You don't pick some random battery supply that can't provide a single test report, and you don't let your supplier choose. This means that when you, the way you need to work with your supply chain is that you have complete control. You know which supplier provides the plastic material. You know where your batteries, your movements, your sensors, where everything is coming from. Well, not everything. I wouldn't say everything is realistic, but a significant part of your bill of materials, you need to hand pick the raw material suppliers. Contact each one directly. Don't ask your supplier in China or elsewhere to do it for you or Vietnam or Turkey. It's not going to work out. They are not compliance experts. That's your job. And that's the end of it. So yeah, this is really the way that big companies are working with, with substance compliance. And just to give you an idea of what one of these documents can look like, this is a public document from the uh, Citizen Miyota website. And here you can see that uh, Citizen Watch Co. Limited certifies that it is compliant with the limit set by Directive 2015-863. This is the ROHS directive, by the way, for all course movements. Okay, And they also provide this. Well, they, they, uh, they just declare that it's compliant. But I would believe anyway that this is, 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 is accepted, especially when it's issued by a, a world-leading brand like, like, like Citizen. Okay? Now, keep in mind, if you would go to some random movement manufacturer or let your supplier pick, pick uh, the component, uh, then you won't receive this. And some of you may argue, yeah, but it's going to get so expensive. You're not thinking about the costs here. Well, if you factor in... the f Okay, it's, it's true that... If you, you buy brand components, yeah, it can be more expensive and you might also end up with a better product. But end of the day, if you factor in how much it's going to cost you to retest everything twice per year in terms of testing every plastic, every fabric, every button, every any material, right? And you're going to get everything tested on, on, a, on a frequent basis. That's going to be a lot more expensive than buying compliant materials from trusted, verifiable sources from day, in, from day one. But if you can't get that done for whatever reason, then lab testing is ultimately the only way to verify compliance. 
there's no other way. Either you obtain supplier test reports and you've got to work for that. Again, I want, I, I've said it five times now, don't expect your suppliers to do the legwork. It's not going to work out, okay? You need to f handpick the raw material suppliers. You need to contact them directly, obtain these documents, and that's just how things work. But in case you can't do that, maybe because of the industry or other reasons, or maybe you can obtain test reports for some components or materials, but not all, then you need to arrange third-party lab testing. This is the only, only other way to verify compliance in this case. Now, the drawback is that lab testing is not free. It's, it's quite expensive. And ultimately, I mean, I can't quote prices here, but at least not specific cost, because they depend on the number of materials and colors. And they also depend on the material type and the number of relevant substances. You don't test every single substance under reach for every single material. Instead, you will see that say a reach test, we're talking the same regulation here, is very different when it's applied to say a polyester fabric as compared to PP plastic, for example, just to give an idea. But ultimately what you get is, is a test report. That's what all of this comes down to in the end, that you receive a test report like this one, and this is an antique from, from 2014, uh, SGS, but hopefully it's going to say something like this, like pass, 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 or ND that's not detected. Right, uh, another major topic here is that of ta test report validity. And one thing that often gets um, a lot of people confused is that there's no fixed date of expiry on test reports. Let's see on this one. No, there's not, it's just a date. This was issued on March 24, 2014. And ultimately, a test report is valid, if I can even use that term, for the specific batch of products and materials that were tested at the time. That's, it's, it's just relevant to something that happened at a given time. So we don't have a clear expiry date. And the regulations don't, usually at least, don't provide a clear answer to, to when can we consider a test report to be expired. But there are a few different cases that can at least serve as, as, as um, let's say, signposts. And let's see if batch testing is required, which it is, say, under CPSIA. When new substances have been added, or when limits have been adjusted, which tends to happen fairly frequently. Now, what's the answer here? What's the conclusion? When it comes to lab testing, it ultimately comes down to cost versus risk. It's ultimately up to you to decide how often you want to get something tested. And that in turn depends on risk and, and uh, which of course depends on the product type, the age group, the type of materials and, and so on and so forth and weight this against the cost.